Hi brothers and sisters and welcome to the channel. This is Kenny Gibbons with Fifth Seal Ministries. I felt it was important for me to cover something that affects us all. Many of us who live comfortable lives never stop to think about our mortality. Death is the very real aspect of our current condition. And as life goes on, we're reminded of the pain that it brings. Seeing death around us only serves as a reminder that our time will come and we don't know when. The scriptures have a lot to say about this subject, so let's explore a few. Psalm 139 verse 16 states, Your eyes have seen my formless substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there were not one of them. Job 14 verses 1 through 6 continues to expand on this. It states, Man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. Like a flower he comes out and withers. He also flees like a shadow and does not remain. You also open your eyes on him and bring him into judgment with yourself. Who can make the clean out of the unclean? No one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. And you have set his limits so that he cannot pass. Look away from him so that he may rest until he fulfills his day like a hired worker. Finally, let's consider what James 4.14 has to say. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, for you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. From these passages, we can gather a couple of very clear points. A specific number of days are determined by God, and no matter the number, they are all spent quickly. This thought can be alarming for a lot of us. We tend to just work through the major events of our lives and follow the assumption that we will make it through all of them. We grow up, we go to school, establish a career, start a family, and start solidifying our household until we eventually retire. All of these things are wonderful in their respective places. But what if we get to the end of our preordained days and we realize that we've spent all of our energy on our own goals and on our own dreams and have spent very little time on serving God's purposes? Reality begins to sink in. We're confronted with the thought that each and every one of us will appear before the Lord and will give an account of everything that we have done. This concept has troubled many great Christians throughout history. Martin Luther once stated, There are only two days on my calendar, today and the day of judgment. If you knew that you would stand before God tomorrow, would that change how you would conduct yourself today? Wouldn't you be motivated to do whatever you can to live in a way that's pleasing in His sight? Here's the thing. We don't know how much time we have left. There's no guarantee that any of us will make it to the next day. God knows, and He has it in His control. Now before this starts to worry you, I do want to clarify something. Those who are truly part of God's people will not be condemned. Christ took the punishment we deserved because of our lifelong sin and put us in right standing with God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 states, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ imputed, or gave, us his righteousness, so that we can stand before the righteous judge without blemish. Oh, how great and wonderful is the love of Christ for us! How amazing it will be to be presented blameless before our Lord on that day! This does not apply to everyone, however. If you're not found to be one of God's people, then you will answer for your lifetime of sin and will be condemned to hell. Please, commit your life to Christ before it's too late. Romans 10.9 states, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Don't put this off. Cry out to Jesus right away because tomorrow is not promised to any of us. So in light of all of this, how do we respond? Ephesians 5 verse 15 to 17 states, So then be careful how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand 
what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians points out that we should make the best use of the time that we have left. We can cry out to the Lord and request that He uses us in such a way that makes up for all those wasted years. What does this mean? It means that no matter what stage of your life that you're in, there's always hope that you can choose to begin living for the Lord and be pleasing to Him. As long as you have breath, you have been granted an opportunity to redirect your path towards godliness. Jonathan Edwards, one of America's greatest theologians, was struck by this reality. In a sermon titled, The Preciousness of Time and the Importance of Redeeming It, Edwards states, Time is precious for the following reasons. First, because a happy or miserable eternity depends on the good or ill improvement of it. Second, time is very short, which is another thing that renders it very precious. Third, time ought to be esteemed by us very precious because we are uncertain of its continuance. Fourth, time is very precious because when it is past, it cannot be recovered. If we have lived 50 or 60 or 70 years and have not improved our time, now it cannot be helped. It is eternally gone from us. All that we can do is to improve the little that remains. If a man has spent all his life but a few moments unimproved, all that is gone is lost, and only those few remaining moments can possibly be made his own. And if the whole of a man's time be gone, and it be all lost, it is irrecoverable. As you can tell, Edwards thought a lot about this subject. It's no surprise that this man was greatly used by God. Edwards had a deep and pervasive mindfulness of eternity, and it's found all over the sermons that he wrote. Imagine that you and I held on to the thought that our time is short. How much more will we want to serve our Lord? As we live each day, we can remind ourselves to live well, because someday soon, we will give an answer for the time given to us. Of course, we cannot please God in our own strength. But we can humble ourselves before God and ask that He does the work in us and through us. We are not alone in this. God has given us His Word to direct our steps. He has given us Himself through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to empower us to walk rightly. And He has given us each other as companions on our journey to His mighty throne. So in light of all of this, How will you begin to live for God today? Personally, it makes me want to pray more fervently, read the word more for transformation and renewal, and it makes me want to be obedient to all of his commands. If heaven is just around the corner, I want to live wholeheartedly and uncompromisingly for the Lord. When everything is said and done, the only thing that matters is what we have done for him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how we long to see you on that day. We know our time is short in this life. So I pray that while we still remain here on earth, that we live our lives for your glory. Help us to live in a way that is pleasing to your sight, and in doing so, we reap the eternal rewards that come with it. We thank you for not only warning us of that coming day, but also empowering us to prepare for it. We are not deserving of this kindness, but we are so grateful that you've bestowed it to us. Lord, I pray you help us all to live up to the calling that you've given each of us so that we can approach your throne boldly in joy, knowing that we've accomplished the plans you've laid out for us. We love you, Lord, and we praise your holy name to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to go forth Redeem the time that was lost and spend the rest of your days in service of our King. For that final day is coming, and it's coming quickly.